You are listening to the cycling podcast at the Giro d'Italia in association with Rafa. Today we are in Cagliari. Where are we, Lionel? We're in Cagliari Airport, in the departure lounge. Haven't gone through security yet. yet. Feeling nervous. Getting nervous, aren't you? I like to get through security a bit earlier than this, I must admit. It's very fraught. We haven't got our usual microphone set up, have we? It's the Buffalo's birthday, and it's not been the best birthday so far, has it? Mm, I've had some pretty terrible birthdays, but, uh, well, we've spent a lot of today in the car, driving to get here, flying to Sicily tonight... But we have just watched a, a very exciting stage, and that's probably been the highlight of my birthday, the final 15 kilometres of today's stage. What about the half bottle of wine you just had half an hour ago? Lionel, that's a huge exaggeration. I had a, a couple of, of sips of, of, of a small bottle of wine. But, you know, it's my birthday. I can, I can do that. Um, give us the, the, give us, tell us what happened today, please. Buon compleanno. That's happy birthday in Italian. Well, I don't know if we've got the rights to the Italian version of happy birthday. We'll maybe sing that to you over dinner tonight when we get to our hotel. I think we established at breakfast that it is now parity between Richard's age and his hematocrit. <laughs> oh, super, a superhuman 54%. Is that right? No, no, no. Knock at least 10 off that. Um, yes, stage three of the Giro d'Italia from Tortoli to Cagliari. And it was... Well, it was a day that started a little bit earlier than scheduled, didn't it? They brought the, f- the start forward by around about 20 minutes, almost caught us out when we were in the docks down at Tortoli this morning. Lovely sunny day, but also a very windy day, particularly in the last sort of 25 or so kilometres. Um, and there was a big split. Quick step floors drove, well, Bob Jungle's four quick step floors drove it very, very hard, forced almost all of the quick step team away. Uh, Andre Greipel missed it. Um, well, everyone missed it, really. But uh, the key thing was that Fernando Gaviria made it. And really, it was a, a dolly of a finish for Gaviria. If he'd lost that, then questions would have been asked. Um, it's asked last night, if you'll recall. <laughs> indeed, yeah. Well, as uh, the curse of the cycling podcast, we wrote him off yesterday. And today, he is the stage winner and in the pink jersey. Uh, we're still digesting the results at the moment. Uh, but it doesn't appear to be too much damage done to um, anybody else. The big loser today, Rowan Dennis of BMC, crashed uh, 10 kilometres or so from the finish, lost about five minutes. Pierre Rollon's lost some time. I think everybody else is unscathed. Uh, Gaviria in pink, and we are hot-footing it, really, to Sicily. We've got to get on the plane in around about 45 minutes' time, I think. Yeah, quick step stage, a bit of an ambush, didn't they? It reminded me of 2009 HCC High Road when they packed that front group. Michael Rogers, I think, on that occasion, forced a split in the Camargue, and you know Mark Cavendish won that stage. Uh, six riders in that group. It was Bob Youngles that forced the split initially, but when you see so many riders from the same team up, up at the front like that and going clear, you, you think that you know they're, they're working to some kind of plan, aren't they, Daniel? Well, yeah, I'm not sure Quick Step can ever really stage an ambush in, in the wind. I mean, it's a bit like seeing a bloke walk past with goggles, uh, um, flippers, and not knowing that he's going to go scuba diving and being surprised when he then goes scuba diving. I mean, we know that Quick Step are going to do this. Every time it's windy, they always do this. So, but... I mean, we, we always act as though and talk as though teams have been caught out and they've not been attentive enough and they've not been concentrating. In reality, um, 80% of sticking with an echelon is to do with legs, isn't it? And the width of the road, really, as well, because once uh, you run out of tarmac and there's nowhere to shelter, that's when the split happens. And, we, I mean, we saw Andre Greipel miss it and then make a superhuman effort to try and recover his losses. But as we saw there... He got into it, then he seemed to be bumped out of it, and he lost his place and hooked up briefly with Gary Thomas, who seemed to be trying to bridge across on his own and was stuck in in no-man's land. It looked like we weren't getting great pictures at the time, but... Uh, you know, terrifically exciting 
racing. And yeah, Daniel's right. We of course we expect that from Quick Step, but still, it's still hard a hard thing to do. For a lot of the stage, we saw some teams had big numbers at the front. Bahrain, Francis Dejeu actually were very impressive. They had a lot of riders at the front, but at a key moment where the road turned, Quick Step knew that that was coming, and they they packed the front with 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 lots of numbers, and off they went. And Bob Jungles really was man of the match, wasn't he? He did a lot of the work, um, drove it very, very hard. At one point, had almost got away on his own, hadn't he? Um, and he had the... I think it must have been Nathan Haas with him briefly. But then, for some reason, they all brought it back together again, the quick-step riders at the front, presumably because they feared if they didn't have Gaviria at the front in the finish, they might well have got beaten. And from that position of strength... Uh, anything other than a quick step floors win would have been not just an upset but a travesty really it was Gaviria's to lose wasn't it a lot of pressure on him uh, Max Richese did a great job sort of leading him out in the finish Nathan Haas did the right thing as well I thought jumping at about 400 300 to go uh, might have caught them out that was a good move by him he's been riding well hasn't he we saw him off the front yesterday as well um, and yeah but Gaviria Daniel that came up with a good analogy earlier Bob Jungles. Well, you can say it, Daniel. What, go on, go on, go on, because go on, I'm going to come out with another one in a minute. Oh, OK, Bob Jungles dribbled it around the whole team uh, up to the, the goal line, left it, sort of put his foot on it and left it for uh, Gaviria to nod it into the net, kneel down, nod it into the net. No, I was just going to say, you're talking analogies, metaphors. I forgot the snorkel earlier. The quick step. When you say quick step, uh, snorkel. I wouldn't have known. <laughs> when, <laughs> you're, you're imaginary. <laughs> <laughs> quick, so seeing quick step at the front of a bunch in crosswinds is the equivalent of seeing someone seeing a bloke with a snorkel goggles and flippers and being surprised when he goes scuba diving the other thing you mentioned Daniel was that the finish in Cagliari was in Via Roma now there are Via Romas in Italian towns everywhere isn't there but uh, that's significant because it's the finishing straight of Milan San Remo where Gaviria uh, got bumped out of contention last year yesterday Gaviria bumped Caleb Ewan out of contention you could argue and today Gaviria wins um, uh, perhaps you know given his performance the last two days slightly overdue stage win and to get the pink jersey as well it's all come up roses for him and it's a bit of an odd one that Via Roma because presumably if you follow it you don't get to Rome you actually topple into the off a cliff and into the sea because the, the original well the Via Roma in San Remo that is the that does actually lead to Rome if you follow it far enough you can only actually follow it to Rome if you are indeed wearing swimming trunks flippers oh. <laughs> <laughs> snorkel and goggles we spent all afternoon planning this first segment <laughs> I'd love to say that's true. Um, we we spent no time planning this segment because we're on the we're on the hoof, aren't we? We're in Cagliari Airport. Um, they've rolled out the pink carpet. The riders will be coming through here at some point in the next hour. They they will be on a charter flight. Um, Already seen dribs and drabs of people connected with the Giro. Paolo Bettini. We saw him had a coffee. Well, we didn't we didn't really have a coffee with him. We acknowledged him as he had a coffee. Um, Paolo Bettini had a coffee at the next table to us. That's the former multiple classic winner. Um, Giro stage winner, world champion. Yeah, we've seen um, Pippo Pozzato's agent, Luca Mazzanti. We thought Pippo himself might make an appearance. It wouldn't be the first time that he has um, been found in an airport before the before the rest of the peloton have finished a race in the, in the vicinity. Well, I speculated that he might have given his transponder to one of his teammates to take to the finish line while he uh, got here to the airport and checked in early. Um, but yeah, there's a crowd here. The riders will be coming through. The logistics of this island hopping, though, are quite significant. We're here to get on our flight, mainly because we didn't want to go on the overnight ferry. Is that right? Yeah, um, it's a marathon, not a sprint, isn't it? And a, an overnight ferry, especially in this wind, very choppy waters. We, we drove up the coast, very, very choppy indeed. Um, and it was, I mean, after two fairly low-key-ish days on the Giro, today was exciting, but it maybe even promised more than it delivered. When we drove up and saw how strong the wind was we thought there could be real damage done and as we watched the the splits happen that we thought you know the likes of Quintana Adam Yates might lose significant time today and it it promised more than it delivered in that respect it was exciting to watch but all the all the the contenders with the exception of Rohan Dennis if we include him as a contender finished safely in that group 13 seconds behind including the likes of Quintana and Adam Yates they'll be absolutely cock a hoop about that I would have thought um, but it's interesting isn't it and I don't want to tempt fate or anything but no crashes either yet no no significant crashes and you usually do get that in these nervous opening days and so 
it's felt a bit like the Tour de France last year where we've kind of been eased into it. And I don't know whether that maybe has something to do with such a significant stage looming to Etna on uh, on Tuesday after the rest day. Um, we're going to talk about that, I think, in the next part, aren't we, Lionel? Well, yeah, just before we go through security and my nerves calm down a bit because we'll be the right side of the airport at that point. The thing about the split was that because it was so quick step heavy and there wasn't, they needed to be one or maybe two Giro contenders in that to really give the impetus for them to work and for it all to shatter behind because I think once they realised in the second group that it wasn't gaining big time and there was nobody really really dangerous up there the interest was let's all just keep together at a big pack so sort of 50 60 70 riders all all together had there been one or two wild cards up there say a Nibali or um, you know anyone else who might have an out you know a, a good chance of the top 10 we could have seen real fireworks behind but nevertheless an exciting final day um, after two sort of so-so days, just before we go through, Richard, how would you compare it to the Netherlands, the start last year? It's been very different, hasn't it? Yeah, the Netherlands was a party, wasn't it? And, and it was, you really felt, obviously you're in, in a, a country with a big cycling mad population. I, I don't feel like we've seen the best of Sardinia. Um, I think watching it on the TV, it's looked spectacular and beautiful. For whatever reason, we haven't perhaps seen the, the best of it. Um, I know Sicily pretty well and, and, and I'm looking forward to, to, to going there again. Um, I'll have to come back to Sardinia, I think, to see the best of it. We've eaten extremely well. People are very, very friendly as well. Um, there's been a real enthusiasm for the, the, the Giro. And, and in, a, in a sense, I don't really understand it because, as we discovered to our surprise yesterday, the population of Sardinia is really quite, quite large, two, two million or so, um, which is bigger than I expected it. And so, I don't know, there hasn't been the same fervour around it as there was, as we saw in the Netherlands. But a successful, a successful three days, I think. And, uh, yeah, looking forward to, to Sicily and Etna. Well, after Daniel's comment yesterday about the Italians not going mad for bunting, we saw nothing but bunting today, all strewn across the roads in all of the towns. Certainly, we drove a lot of the course today, so uh, we saw all the pink bunting, the pink bicycles and everything. And uh, just on the islands and the phenomenon of the Giro in Sardinia and Sicily, uh, our first episode of Kilometre Zero is coming out tomorrow morning. That's Monday morning, um, and it will talk about cycling and sardinia the giro sardinia sicily and that will be on the normal cycling podcast feed on monday morning let's go and check in i mean do you know do you know etna i do not i don't know etna at all uh and the time that was last used when contador one we're using a different side Mm. so we're gonna have a look tonight and whether we uh go have a look at it tomorrow or not we'll see how that works logistically that's yeah interesting so adam presumably hasn't been to wreck it has he no 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 I guess that's the case for most riders and teams. Yeah, look, we Adam w- wasn't so interested in... He's one of those guys, uh, certain climbs, depending on how technical he's interested in, and he wasn't interested in having a look at that tomorrow. What does it do to the start of a race, especially for the overall guys, to have a, a mountain stage like that so early in the race? Yeah, well, we're going to see who's arrived in form, that's for sure. Uh, and I think that you'll see some gaps straight away in it now, because I think there's some guys are really thinking the last week, last week, but uh, well, we're in a position we know Adam's in, in good shape, so it'd be a good little test for him. It's an interesting one, isn't it? Because form can change. It's a long time between now and, and the final week. And yeah. what happens, I guess, on Etna might not be that decisive or, or indicative of who's going to do well in this Giro. Yes and no. I think uh, guys will improve. But I think if, if you're in good shape now, I think your form's not going to go anywhere in the next two and a half yeah. weeks. But uh, you know, GC guys won't want, in, won't want to be losing time tomorrow that's on Etna. Now, if you lose a minute on Etna, that's okay. Yeah, there's time to make up. But at the end of the day, uh, you know, the top guys don't want to lose time on each other any, anywhere. How do you think it'll be raced? I mean, will it, will it be a case of maybe guys who are in great form maybe taking advantage of, of little weaknesses perhaps if the opportunity arises? Definitely, definitely. And I think you saw the last couple of weeks the guys who are in good shape. Uh, I think they'll, they'll will try to take time if possible. So I think it'll be raced aggressively, and at the end of the day, whoever whoever wins that night usually will take over the Mali Rosa. So it's going to be uh, it's going to be on. You are listening to the Cycling Podcast at the Giro d'Italia, supported by Science in Sport. Science in Sport, fueled by science. We just heard there from Matt White, the sports director, Orica Scott, uh, talking us through our our flight from 
Sardinia to Sicily. It wasn't quite as short as that. It was it wasn't a long flight, um, but it took a bit longer than the minute and a half or so we heard there from Matt White talking about Etna. Uh, we can't quite see Etna from here, but it's on this island somewhere. Well, it is. I don't really. I haven't got my bearings yet. I'm keeping an eye out because it's, it's, awf- it's an awfully long way from here. Is it really? It's right over the other side of the island completely. We are. Where are we? We're in uh, Trapani. So Sicily. Um, wild dogs roaming around in the airport car park here make me nervous. Everything makes me nervous. Being late for flights makes me nervous. Wild dogs makes me nervous. I don't think it's a wild dog. It's it's just a dog. It's got a collar on it. I suggest it's not a wild dog. Looks feral to me. Anyway, um, what are we expecting? <laughs> I hope you don't start pointing at people, random people, men in the street, and alleging that they're mafiosi when we leave the car park in a minute. <laughs> no, I certainly won't. I'm wiser than that. Um, so, Etna, we're looking forward to the next stage of the Giro. Um, what uh, what should we expect, Daniel? Well, it's a uh, different climb from the one they did in 2011, so it's harder. Um, it's a pretty uneven climb in the sense that there are some pretty tough bits at the start and then it evens out. Um, but it's, I think, 6.6% average over about 17 kilometres. So it's not dissimilar to something like Mont Ventoux in length, but it's a bit easier. Um, wind could be a factor, as it is on Mont Ventoux. It's, it's more barren even than Mont Ventoux. Um, hopefully there'll be no eruptions. Um, but I think that a lot of the riders will know it well because in recent years, a lot of riders have gone to train up there at a place called the Rifugio Sapienza. Um, we'll hear from Paolo Tiralonga, the Astana rider, later about where well, he's one of the riders who trains up there quite frequently and Nibali also has trained up there. He probably knows the climb very well already. But yeah, it'd be interesting. Um, I think... I think Geraint Thomas is going to go well. I think problems for him are going to come later in the race, possibly. Um, I'm curious to see what Thibaut Pino does because I think he's, as I said the other day, I think he's very, very relaxed. One factor that we haven't spoken about and I think we'll revisit in the next few days as regards Thibaut Pino is the weather because uh, he doesn't go particularly well in very hot weather. I don't think it's going to be sizzling in the next few days, but it, it might be 25, 26 degrees and he would probably prefer it to be a bit cooler maybe. Um, and um, Nairo Quintana, I think everyone just expects to be Nairo Quintana and do what he does. Yeah, I don't want to tempt fate or be flippant, but um, it's not going to erupt, is it? I mean, it erupted in March when a BBC film crew were up there, and I think they had quite a lucky escape. It does erupt fairly regularly, doesn't it? Lionel, you're nervous enough already. I think you know. <laughs> yeah, I think we could do without any forecasts of, of Etna eruptions. That might just tip you over the edge. Well, we know that Thibaut Pino doesn't go particularly well in the heat. We don't know who the best rider in this field is in in volcanic eruptions, do we? <laughs> yeah, when they say that you know the the road's melting in the heat, we we don't want it literally melting in the heat. Um, should we quickly hear from Rod Ellingworth, Team Sky race coach? On uh, they've got two team leaders, Mikel Lander, Geraint Thomas, and just a brief word from him about uh, Mount Etna. Well, I think, it's, I think everybody will ask asking the same sort of questions, won't they? You know, how hard do you push on the stage? My, my theory is you, you, you perhaps take the race on. I don't, I don't know yet exactly what we're going to do. Um, obviously, the DSs do the final di- tactics, but, you know, for me, it's like it's another race. You don't know what's going to happen next week. So you don't, if you, take, if you have an opportunity, take it, isn't it? You know, so. Has anyone been and looked at the climb? Because it's not the same road up as in 2011, is it? Yeah, we know. You know, obviously we're lucky with Dario. He's great as a DS and, and knowing every pothole in Italy near enough. So, um, yeah, we, we, yeah, we've done enough on there to know what it is, yeah. Have either Lander or Thomas actually been there or has it been left to other people? You put me under the pump now. I can't remember if they have <laughs> I'm just trying to think if they have or not. I think I think they have, but I'm not 100 percent sure. So don't put this out. <laughs> okay, Rod. Well, we'll see how it plays out, and if and if they do well, then it will all be down to that recce. Exactly. <laughs> Rod Ellingworth there. I also heard some comments after today's stage from TJ Van Garderen looking ahead to Etna. He could do all right there. He's been going well, rode well at Romandy recently. It's a sort of climb that might suit him. You know, it's not too steep. Uh, riders like like him, sort of uh, de Moulin as well, perhaps. But you know, it's it, as Matt White said earlier, it's very hard to really. He thinks some riders will be in different form in a couple of weeks. You know, it's a long time between now and the, the, that decisive final week. But there are riders going well, and Van Garderen mentioned that, that Nibali will be particularly keen to perform well. 
in Sicily. And, and if he goes, you have to follow him. You know, if, you're, if you've got designs on, on winning this race, you have to follow him. And so it only takes one of those favourites to make a move, to be strong, to put the others under pressure for it to really all explode, um, metaphorically. And, uh, and uh, that should be interesting. But speaking of Nibali, um, we do, of course, have the Shark's Tale uh, return last night to, uh, after popular requests. I think there were online petitions, there were protests, there were marches. And it's back, the Shark's Tale. So let's have the second instalment, please, Daniel. Allora il lupo sospirò e domandò, ti sei già fatto un'idea, benedetto figlio, di cosa vuoi fare nella vita? Then the wolf sighed and asked, have you already got an idea, dear son, of what you want to do in life? Well, Daniel, we go to Messina, don't we, in a couple of days' time. Is there, there's a start there, is that right? Oh, we'll finish there, finish there, of course, before we go across, because that's where the, the, the water starts, and then we've got to make another hop across water, haven't we? How do we get across from Sicily to the mainland? It's a ferry, isn't it, I think. Um, it, so nothing to be nervous and frightened about? No, I think it's about a 15-minute ferry. You can probably swim if you were... Uh, I mean, you were mistaken for one of the Giro riders earlier today, so um, <laughs> you must be looking fairly fit. Um, Nibali, obviously, is going to have a lot of fans on Mount Etna. Um, I'm curious to meet or to find out whether the... the Il Lupo, of course, the wolf who was mentioned in that clip there is going to be there. I'm sure he is. If not, we're going to go to his video shop. They, the family, st- I think they still own the video shop in in um, Messina. This is how, whenever Nibali talks about how he got into professional cycling, um, he always talks about how his family had these Francesco Moser videos in the video shop. Um, just on Wolfie, Lionel, I think you'll like this. Um, I noticed a story in the Sardinian local press, I think it was today or yesterday, that a, a vast cargo of counterfeit Giro merchandise was intercepted in Alghero last week. And um, there were, I don't I think that the estimated value of it or what it was going to sell for <laughs> you know, was, was 35,000 euros. And I think we're getting bitten here in the uh, intro. You, can you feel getting bitten? The feral dogs. Or something it's either the feral dogs or the wolves. The wolf, <laughs> the counterfeit wolves. Yeah, so um, part of the cargo... I, I'd like to think over half the cargo, um, just for the purposes of this story, um, was, was, was Wolfie. Wolfie is stuffed Wolfie, which I remember I bought last year. Um, and, of course, how can we forget, Wolfie was banned, wasn't it, in France, when we went into France, um, because it was seen as, as provocation towards the French farmers. They weren't allowed to sell Wolfie at the Giro. Of course, if we hear of uh, any Sicilians manufacturing counterfeit wolfies. We'll be keeping quiet about that, won't we? We won't be tipping off the police. We'll be observing no matter. Another bit of local news, actually, I've just remembered. Um, I don't know, this passes by at the time, but there was, there's was there been a big controversy in Sicily about the quality of the roads for the Giro, and um, the local authorities weren't going to pay to have the, the roads repaired. RCS went to look at the courses of these two stages in April, and they said they weren't fit for purpose, and there was even talk of the, road, of the stages being cancelled. Um, I don't know what they would have done. I don't know what the, the plan B would have been. But um, there have been all sorts of emergency meetings and they finally stumped up the half million euros to actually prepare the race. So I'll be curious to see how they're looking on Tuesday and Wednesday. My name is Morgan Frost. I am the front of house and cafe supervisor at Rafa's Imperial Works. I started doing events for Rafa in late 2016, driving the H-Van, making coffees, helping with organized rides and RCC events. I started cycling properly in 2008 when I was quite seriously ill, probably in the throes of the late 2000s fixed gear community, and it's got worse and worse since. Road, cyclocross, and track, I do light touring whenever I can. At the moment, I'm clocking around 300 to 400k a week. The Rafa Cycling Club is the largest global community of its kind. Members share their passion for the road through rides, events, exclusive club kits and racing. Find out more at rafa.cc. Thank you very much indeed to Rafa, our main sponsor. Um, We'll be telling you about stuff that's going on at Rafa throughout the Giro, um, but we're very grateful to them indeed for, for sponsoring us and uh, bringing you these nightly shows. And as you mentioned earlier, Lionel Kilometer Zero begins on Monday. I should also say that on Monday we'll be releasing the May episode of the cycling podcast Femina. That's myself and Orla Shinawi, um up in Leeds 
doing an event with Lizzie Dignan uh, for the launch of her book at Watterson's and Leeds. So we recorded that event and we've got um, the podcast Femina coming out sometime on Monday before we resume this podcast on Tuesday for the next stage of the Giro d'Italia. Uh, anything else tonight, chaps? Well, You've got we, Tira Longo. Yeah, we're going to hear from Paolo Tira Longo. We should just say that we've had to move inside because we're getting absolutely savage there by killer mosquitoes. Um, and yeah, I spoke to Paolo Tiralongo this morning in Tortoli. Um, Tiralongo riding his last Giro d'Italia, one of the, I think, three Sicilians in the field. Nibali is one, Giovanni Vis- Visconti is another, and Tiralongo is the third one. Lived for a long time in Bergamo in the north of Italy, but obviously knows Mount Etna very well and trains there quite often. It's a lot harder than the climb to Etna we did in 2011. We're taking it from a side which is a lot tougher. A bit after Nicolosi is what we've done in the past, but then we'll turn right, and that's where the really critical point comes. There are ramps of over 12%, so there it'll really start to bite. Well, before we go, chaps, should we just hear briefly from Max Chiandri, sports director of BMC Racing? Um, along with Team Sky, they were one of the very few teams who came in with two riders who had some sort of overall ambition. TJ Van Garderen and Rowan Dennis, both somewhat untested um, in Giro terms, at least. And, and for Rowan Dennis, he was hoping to uh, see just how far his legs could take him. Unfortunately, he will have to reassess uh, his ambitions here after crashing today on stage three, losing a lot of time, and we understand quite bashed up. Um, he's got a rest day to recover, of course, so hopefully he will start the stage to Etna. But let's hear from Max Chiandri, because last year uh, they had a very different Giro. They came here without any kind of overall ambitions and without a sprinter, and at times they looked like a bit of a rudderless ship. No, for sure, yeah, as you say, you know, it's a different year this year, having uh, TJ Van Garderen and... Uh, and Rowan Dennis was uh, is kind of in a new role of uh, GC rider. It changes uh, a lot uh, the feeling, the, the the mentality, the spirit, the the vibes. You know, I mean, you you kind of ride away more focused. Uh, you you have a goal, you have a goal, so you have a final goal uh, into Milano, and uh, and it makes it better. I know the stress is it, the stress, the, the 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 whole everybody just pulls up more but it's what we're here for you know we're here to, to win races to, to do our best you know last year I don't want to say it was a, it was different you know you had to kind of improvise uh, motivate a little bit more some days it's hard to try and find something to do with not having a sprinter so yeah today everybody's more focused on uh, on our final goal so is there, is there a more of a feeling of intensity in the bus than when you when you get to the start this morning yeah, for sure. I, I as a, I'm lead director here, you know, I had to pull out the meeting. You know, first day, I just felt a little bit uh, pressure. Uh, it's a good pressure, you know. I mean, I'm prepared. Uh, I did my homework, um, but we're not we're not perfect, you know. I mean, people are not perfect. We make mistakes. Uh, we try not to make mistakes. So we try and give them best directions. Uh, but again, the team has to assemble by themselves. As much as I can be part of that team, I'm in a car. Um, they're on the bike. They have the, the the they have the feeling of what's happening. You know, they can see the movements of the peloton, the riders, the the the, the other guys from other teams. You know, so it's it's down always to them. Well, Max Chiandri always strikes me as too laid back to lay down the law. I don't know about you, chaps, but I can't imagine him cracking the whip too hard. But uh, it'll be interesting to see how T.J. Van Garderen gets on. Particularly, Etna could well suit him. Um, and then once he's up there overall and the time trial, you just never know, do you? You never know with that guy. Um, well, he's he's seems to be coming here in a fairly relaxed state of mind. There's been a lot of pressure on him. Uh, you know, he's he's a he's a rider who's supposed to be contending for Grand Tours. That's the sort of salary he's on at BMC, and he's he's not done that. Um, and you'd think that would put a lot of pressure on him, but he does. He seems. He seems fairly relaxed. He's obviously had a good build-up and rode, rode well at Romandy, so it'll be interesting to see how he goes. Um, should we wrap things up? Because we, we need to get to our, our hotel tonight. We do. Where, where are we sleeping? Are we sleeping with the fishies this evening? Chefalu. We're about two hours away, um, so we, we better hit the road. When we come back to you on Tuesday, we'll be absolutely covered in mosquito bites. <laughs>
won't, 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 won't matter to the listeners. They won't, they won't, that won't be obvious through, through the medium of audio. Lucky them. Anyway, we should wrap things up. Um, before we do, uh, just a quick reminder, our media partners, The Telegraph, um, you follow their live blog. Somebody, our friend John McCleary, very good at his doing daily blog, live blogs on the Giro. So if you're at work and uh, wanting to know what's going on, follow his while well, you've listened to the podcast and follow his live blog. Also, Eurosport, um, you reminder, you can watch the Giro Detail live and exclusive on Eurosport and Eurosport Player. UK viewers can also watch highlights of each stage at 10 p.m. on free to air channel quest and there's a special offer for the Eurosport player 29.99 for an all access pass for the rest of 2017 we'll be giving away um free passes to Eurosport player at some point soon uh Rob Hatch Sean Kelly the commentary team there of course so listen we should wrap things up and and get on the road thank you very much Lionel thank you Richard thank you Daniel see you on Etna thank you Richard happy birthday Happy birthday to you. Thank you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Hallo, marido mio, faccio l'empio.